trying to think of a question for, I think, probably a week now, and I just keep coming up against this conclusion that I'm drawing, <laughs> which is just that life is excruciatingly different, difficult, especially for people who have ideas living inside of them. And so there's really not much you can do except find expression for those things and then pray for some sort of mercy to be bestowed upon you. Like what kind of ideas? Ideas about, I guess, something else other than the material world. Discontent with things as they are. So in the face of that, I'm not really sure what questions to ask anymore. So what was your conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> that life is hard. <laughs> so all you can really do is try to find ways to express that challenge. And then just pray that mercy is given or grace is given and what makes life hard just the discontent with how it is i think if you're someone who can be like who can find joy or pleasure in the material world, you're fine, but if you can't, if you're just a naturally discontent person, then it's just, everything becomes difficult. You know what you've said in the conclusions that you have shared reminds me of something we talked about last night. At the very end of the class, I someone said something that reminded me of Herman Hesse's book, Siddhartha. And it's an interesting if I was to be honest, I haven't really read the book. Um, I've just heard, you know, passages, you know, from various persons. So it may be that most of the things I'm saying about the book may be completely wrong. But <clears throat> you know, Siddhartha is a very nice young man. You know, and he does and pursues and desires what most of us kind of gravitate towards, which is he just wants to have fun, you know, and it's natural. Um, you know, he looks out there and, and if his eyes or ears or nose or tongue or touch 
they send him a message that go there because there is something attractive there, beautiful there, exciting there, pleasurable there. Just go there, have a good time, and he does. You know, so there is no discontent there. And I suppose the sort of discontent that one has at that particular stage is that you pursue something because something about you pushes you towards it. And then you make this journey, and the bigger, the grander, the more complex the desire, the more the longer it will take for you to get there. But eventually, hopefully, if you have the resources, you'll get there. And then you'll kind of live in the cradle of this newfound pleasure. And there comes a point where it's just no longer as fun, you know. You know, it's like you pick up a book and you read the book and after a while it just gets boring. It's only your relationship with that particular book that gets to be categorized as boring. But you don't give up on books completely. You know. And because I think Siddhartha is young and attractive and has a good amount of power, he can get bored by a desire or pleasure. And, you know, he takes a rest and then he goes back into the world and has more fun. You know, it's, I remember at Sierra there was this person, uh, she would just date people constantly, you know. And she would always come and say, I have so much love inside me, I have so much passion inside me, I just want to give it to people. Um, and she would go out with young men, and she would have fun, but then for some strange reason she would be completely satisfied, and then she would break things off and then continue dating other men. So her discontent wasn't about all men, or just relationships in general, or a specific kind of desire. Uh, I think the tragedy that happened to Siddhartha is that while he was walking to, I don't know, maybe a bar or a party, his ears overhear someone talking, you know. And I don't know how these things work, to be honest. I don't know why sometimes you find yourself gravitating towards a conversation that does things that are so unnatural, which is it forces you to think and reflect, you know. You know, there are these... There are these stages you go through, you, you hear something and it makes you think. And the thinking for the most part is a reaction to what you're hearing. You're not really receiving it well. Uh, your personal history comes up, your emotions, your biases, prejudices come up. And thinking becomes a tool to combat what you're hearing. And eventually all of us are cunning enough to kind of get rid of the things that we have heard that may contradict our position in life. Well, that's one way that Siddhartha could hear what he's hearing. The other is you hear something and for some strange reason there is this eruption of emotions and they are very intense. You know, you get consumed by them. Your thinking is completely paralyzed. You don't think about your past, how so-and-so would deal with it. You're kind of just drowning in this ocean of emotions. And you walk around, you know, in, in a sort of a daze. And then the thing with emotions is that they can't be intense inside you for too long of a time because your body can't take it. So eventually your mind, your body, 
does something magical and the intensity of emotions subside. And when the emotions go away, you have a memory of it, but it doesn't really transform you. You just have a feeling. And to kind of continue with your old life, all of a sudden, if initially, you know, emotions were guiding you, the moment the intensity of emotions are gone, the old Allison comes up with all the thoughts, with all the history, and then wraps itself around the emotions to shape it and guide it. And then it just becomes an experience. And there comes, you know, this other um, stage where, you know, you hear something and it doesn't cause you to, to, to think. There is the intensity of emotions, but what this particular emotion has that the previous one didn't have, it comes with a great amount of reflection. You take the stuff in and you're somewhat objective, you know, you don't allow it to be contaminated by ridiculous emotions or your own thought process. You kind of just sit back and just look at it, observe it, examine it. Uh, and then little by little, you know, degrees of emotion enter, but the emotions are kind of guided by your powers of reflection and the thought process are also being guided by reflection. Uh, you know, it's like a reflection, like this root that goes really, really down inside you. You know, and, and I suppose to make the story a bit more interesting, Siddhartha thinks about what the Buddha is saying because the person who is talking is the Buddha, you know. But he doesn't know what, who the Buddha is, what the Buddha is. All he knows is that he heard something and it was interesting, exciting. He thinks about it. And then he has to compare and contrast. Do I want to listen to this thing more and think about what he's saying? Or do I want to go to the party and have a good time with my friends? And he goes to the party. But, you know, the experience had enough intense emotions to kind of just stay alive inside him. He goes home after the party, but, you know, for some strange reason, despite the gathering being very fun for him, and he was drinking and, you know, being intimate with other people, all of a sudden he hears the voice of the Buddha inside his head, and he begins to think. And then he begins to kind of compare the compare and contrast the pleasure of the mind and the pleasure of the body what he's thinking about you know uh, in regards to Buddha's sermon and all the wonderful things he did at the party you know he didn't he wasn't discontent initially he wasn't discontent about sex he wasn't discontent about drinking he wasn't discontent about partying he heard something that made him kind of re-examine and re-evaluate himself in regards to his position in life. And it was devastating for him because in the morning when he gets up, he goes looking for this house and eventually he finds it. And he just sits back by the door and just, you know, quietly listens to what this man is saying. And his discontent grows more and more and more strong and more and more intense. You know? I don't know if the Buddha did Siddhartha a favor. I don't know if Siddhartha did himself a favor by going and listening to this guy talk. Um, and in some ways, I suppose, none of us are in control of what we find attractive and what we gravitate towards. You know, I remember in 1996 or 7, um, I went to a play in Berkeley. And the play had to do with this man being married to this woman. They were both nice people. They were married for about 20 years. He has a job. He works in this office. There is a young secretary. 
the relationship slowly blossoms and he begins to have feelings for her and she begins to have feelings for him. And, you know, they're like 10, 15, 20 years apart. And one day he goes home and his wife says to him that something about you has changed. And then he kind of fesses up saying, yeah, I'm in love with this other woman. And the wife screams and shouts and cries and the man can't do anything, you know. And they eventually kind of separate and the man goes to this other, this younger woman, they become roommates. But there is the age difference, there is the historical difference. Uh, there are just, you're at different stages in life and eventually after a year or so, uh, things begin to smell bad between them, you know. And they separate. He calls his ex-wife. Uh, he says, you know, I made a mistake. And the point is, you know, no one really is to blame. Uh, I suppose if you were to have this kind of philosophy where you have the willpower to stop certain things from happening, you could blame yourself for having fallen in love with another person or you could allow other people to blame you. Uh, but again, I don't think any of us have any control about, you know, who or what we find attractive. There comes a point in the life of Siddhartha where he just becomes really discontent with everything about life. And that's because the Buddha doesn't find anything in life valuable. And maybe it is valuable, but because he sees most people having the wrong relationship in life and with life, people generally just make life valueless because of the relationship. So the Buddha just goes on this rant telling everybody that life has no value, you know. And it's kind of like a baptism of sorts, you know, let's clean you and then put you back into life. And then once you go back into life, you'll be clean enough and you'll have enough tools to go into life without getting too dirty, you know. You know, Siddhartha, which in Sanskrit basically means desires, and the Buddha means, I suppose, not having desires, you know. Uh, or if you have any desires, they are ingrown, you know. You can find them inside yourself and you can, without having any need to go outside to satisfy them. So the only attachment you have really is to yourself and your inner world. His relationship with the Buddha becomes so intense that he loses everything. He can't, you know, have any friends. Uh, and he doesn't want to. He can't be in relationships. He can't drink anymore. He can't have sex anymore. He can't focus on his job anymore. Everything about his life falls apart. All because you know, one day as he was walking, his ears were captured into attention and he enjoyed what he was hearing. Uh, and then from that point on, the relationship grew. You know, so one day Siddhartha goes to the Buddha and says, I want to be your disciple. Is that okay? Can I do that? Because I want what lives inside you. You know, and I suppose both the Buddha and Siddhartha at this stage, they're both novices. I mean, the Buddha has access to certain insights that Siddhartha doesn't have. But what makes the Buddha a novice is his assumption that he could actually teach and he could actually transmit, you know, what lived inside him to another. Uh, and so he says, yeah, you can, you can follow me. And Siddhartha feels really good because if he's around the Buddha all the time, he's going to think that eventually he's going to inherit what lives inside the Buddha. And as the relationship kind of just grows, he falls for this man, hard and deep and intense. 
and loves him. You know, and when you love someone or something, you're more than willing to sacrifice your life. It's your life, you know, has no value anymore because it's in the hands of this other person. And I think ten years pass by, uh, fifteen years pass by, and. Um, he still doesn't have what you know he's looking for he wanted the wisdom of the Buddha but he doesn't have it and I suppose at times you kind of look at yourself and you say after all these years I'm still dependent on this person I don't want to be dependent anymore I want to be my own person I want to be independent and you know something about it just grows tired we don't want to follow this man around anymore just want to sit home and relax you're no longer 20 or 30 you're 50 you know and you look around you and you know your life you have nothing you don't have a house you don't have a car you don't have a job you just go there in the morning you sit this man talks to you feeds you some bread and cheese and then you go home and you look around you your life is a complete mess you know it's empty um, and one day began to make the story slightly interesting. He just, you know, leaves his house at two in the morning, walks towards the Buddha's house and bangs in his door and the Buddha comes out, you know, and says, what's going on? He says, you lied to me. Yeah. And, what do you mean I lied to you? You lied to me. You told me that if I do A, B, C, D, I will become wise. If I do A, B, C, D, I will grow to be okay with discontent. You know, kind of like what Attar says, Ishq dar dar yaay gham gham naak niist or dard bar man rizo darmanam makon chon ke dard te toza darman khosh tar ast. You know, all these ridiculous poems that give me pain and don't remedy it. Just give me pain. Because if you remedy the pain, I will forget the pain. And then I will no longer write poetry. I will no longer reflect. I will no longer sit and meditate. I will no longer cry or shout and scream. I will no longer have intense feelings running in my veins. You know, just let me be with pain. It's much sweeter than its remedy. And I suppose Siddhartha believed that for many, many, many years until his body just couldn't handle it anymore. He couldn't make peace with all the pain that lived inside him. You know, he can't go back to his old life because now he sees too much. Rightly or wrongly, he sees too much. And again, rightly or wrongly, he knows too much. He knows that in the end, perhaps, all oh, pleasures and desires, they kind of lose their luster and leave him empty and naked, you know. And he doesn't know where to go, what to touch, what to pursue. Uh, because he knows the outcome of every pursuit, which is, it'll either turn out to be sour grapes, I can't reach them, and I'll make some sort of an excuse. Or if I was to reach the object of desire, Eventually I'll be satisfied and then I'll have regret. Why did I have to spend all this time, all this energy, waste my life pursuing something that is ultimately meaningless? You know? So he looks at the Buddha and says, you know, you, you made me fall in love with you. You seduced me. You know. You grew inside me more and more and more where I became invisible and you were there all the time, all in hopes that I would get something, you know, in this relationship. And all I, all I have is emptiness, you yeah. know, it's a desert. You know, and it's, there's a difference between being the Buddha and living in poverty and being a novice and living in poverty. The Buddha had just come to a place where he just doesn't care, whereas a novice has expectations, you know. 
So the sort of discontent and dissatisfaction that the Buddha may have is very, very different than what Siddhartha has. The Buddha doesn't know what to tell Siddhartha because for the first time he comes to realize that, yes, he may have insights about life. <clears throat> he may even have wisdom. He may even have been touched by God. But the truth is, each person has to find their own salvation. You know, nothing can be given to anybody. I don't really know how the book ends the story. But I think the Buddha walks away. Maybe that's how the book should end, really, which is the Buddha walks away feeling really, really sad that the only thing that he's able to do is... in some ways just really make people unhappy about their life. That's all he can do. Um, you know, he sees the outcome of pleasure when someone like Siddhartha basically swims in the pleasure without ever seeing the outcome. And when the pleasure falls apart, they just move on to a different kind of pleasure. You know. And, you know, maybe the Buddha walks away and never opens his mouth again to give any teaching to anybody, you know, because he knows that maybe you have to be profoundly gifted or maybe you have to be profoundly liked or loved by the gods where you can kind of live with nothing, in nothing, and be okay. I don't know what Siddhartha does, because Siddhartha now lives in Barzakh, which means purgatory. Uh, you know, he wants to get to paradise, the promised land, to the wisdom that lives inside the Buddha, but he can't get there. And he wants to go back and have a good time with life. He can't get there either, and he has no place to go, really. You know, and I think it's something that Gurdjieff talked about, too that when you become contaminated with these ideas, you should really try to go all the way. Because now you know too much and you see too much. You can't pretend that you're blind and go back and just live your life the way you used to. It just won't work. There comes a point that they'll just bust, they'll break, you know. And you realize that you've been engaged in, you know, just self-deception, even though you know that you shouldn't have, you know, gone back, you still do, because there is no place to go forward. You know, some temperaments, Alison, they're very, very lucky. Your father happens to be one of them. Kazem happens to be another. My father happens to be another. In the Gurdjieffian typology or Enneagram, they're just peacemakers. You know, nothing too much bothers them. It's not that they don't become sad. It's not that they don't question. It's not that they're not ever discontent or unhappy. They're all of that. But somehow, you know, um, you know, when I talk to my father about old age, and he's 90, you know, he laughs, he says, I mean, what do you expect? You want me to be 20 for the rest of my life? That's just the way life works. And he just kind of laughs a little bit. And I say, yeah, yeah, Dad, I made a mistake. He says, yeah, you make a lot of mistakes, you know. It's a conversation I was having with him last night as I was driving home. You know, some temperaments are not as lucky or fortunate. They, you know, they have... Uh, they're a bit more sensitive. You know, they can make peace with the conflict and the paradoxes of life. You know, it's like when you watch the movie The Matrix. I, mean, I don't know why the hell he has to live in room 101, the room of conflict. I don't know why he doesn't get himself a roommate or have a girlfriend. I don't know why he has to live alone. 
I don't know why he has to stay up and constantly search for Morpheus because his dreams can't be realized down here. They have to be realized somewhere else outside of this physical world. And you look at the matrix itself, there are tons of people out there who can live a happy life. They're not discontent. They're not wrestling with life and its events. They're just happy. You know, if not happy, at least they're engaged where their reflective abilities, you know, are paralyzed. You know, your your discontent, and I'm very much the same way. Don't think that just because I'm saying these things, I'm any better or know anything more than you do. But it reminds me of Mantavotir. Conference of the Birds, the first few pages, where this bird from paradise looks at this other bird and says, you know, I don't understand you. You see a rose, you sing. You see the rose die, you sing. When the rose is alive, you sing happy songs. When the rose is dead, you see sad songs, sad songs. Uh, don't you ever like become disgusted by yourself that you flip flop all the time? You're like a Democrat, and um, and, the, and the bird says the the bird doesn't say anything. He just says, you know, I, I like the way I am. He says, what do you mean you like the way you are? You know, how could you be like sad for a minute and then happy for five minutes and then sad for a day and then happy for two minutes? And the bird says, well, what do you think I should do? He says, well, why don't you just come follow me? Follow you where? I don't know, just follow me. I'll, I'll uh, take you to a place where, you know, flowers just don't die. And unfortunately for the spirit, he says, okay, follows. But he can't go all the way, you know, so I'll just kind of, just drops that in the middle of the flight it drops then that's it and out of the 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 birds that follow this you know heavenly bird only three or four survive you know and the ones that survive you know they're they're all sick one is blind one has no legs one has no wings one has no neck uh, and i think you know your lament is actually very very justified and in some ways, it's, it's a great question to ask, you know. First, why do we get contaminated by these ideas? Second, what is it about these ideas that are so attractive, that are so exotic, that kind of lure us into themselves? Third, if they are attractive, if we gravitate towards them, is there an end? Is there like a promised land? And if so, how does one get there? Uh, you know, there are these... Uh, and I think that's what all these trainings are about, because all students eventually come forth and say, I can't go back to my life. What do I need to do? And so, one of the first principles is that uh, you have to engage in this thing called khalvat. Khalvat means to seek solitude. Not just physical solitude. That, um, you know when you put something in oil and take it out, it's slippery, nothing sticks to it. And that's what khalbat is. That something must happen to you where nothing sticks to you. You can't form any attachments. You can't form any relationships. You know, and it's a very, very difficult place. Because as a human being, you know, khalbat means you have to go against everything that is organic and natural about you. 
you know, no thoughts, no emotions, no people around you, no desires, no attachments. Who lives like that? You know. But you know what makes living like this easier, what makes living with discontent easier, if you know, and I go back and I say this because it was true for us. Hussein, Mehdad, and myself, and of course, the teacher Hussein. Really, the four of us just met at the right time. It was the right place, it was the right time, it was the right people. Hussein had something. You know, let's just say he was the Buddha. He was preaching discontent. Discontent with, you know, just being childish and pursuing childish things. And becoming perhaps a bit more mature to pursue the more meaningful things of life. And for him it was politics, it was religion, it was self-knowledge, it was reading, it was entertainment of the intellect, you know. And I think how the three of us, Hussein Mehrdal and myself, survived was that because we all came together at the right time and we all had the same interior in the sense that We were all inwardly broken, you know, and we didn't sit there to compete who amongst us is more broken, you know. And so this brokenness was kind of the bread that all of us shared. We read poetry because we were broken. You know, we went to Hussein's house, we were, we were broken. We went to gatherings. And we gathered together because Cassie was there, you know, where, not during, you know, the time where Hussein Martha and I were kind of engaged on this journey, but when we had gatherings, we had gatherings where the three of us would occupy the same space all the time. Every weekend we had gatherings. We gathered with Hussein once or twice a week, sometimes three times. He would come to the car wash. And the point I'm trying to make is, you know, part of Khalvat is only people who share the same quality of brokenness can enter into your circle. There is no animosity. There is no envy. There is no competition. There is no jealousy. Uh, you know, it's it's such a nice phrase that this guy uses in the cloud of unknowing. Uh, no one knows who wrote this book, but you know, sometimes he starts his paragraphs by saying, "My dear friend in God," you know, and I suppose for us it would be, "My dear friend in brokenness," you know. And it made the suffering, it made the pain, you could endure it better, you could tolerate it better, and it would become more meaningful. And then Hussein would come in and he would read poems, he would give commentary to various verses of the Quran, he would share his own thoughts about various things that to some extent would kind of stop the bleeding for a little bit, and if he couldn't stop the bleeding, at least he made the bleeding meaningful and purposive. Mm -hmm. 